Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be with you today. Uh, I am Pastor Daniel Solberg, pastor of Nativity Lutheran Church in Allison Park. And I have as a guest today my uh, sister, who has come to us this, this weekend to provide some engagement and some articulation of her work among refugees here in the U.S. and as the situation connects with the Central American theater, I uh, will turn, turn over an introduction to her. She can fill you in on, on who she is and where her work has begun and where it has moved. Mary? Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Solberg and I'm with the, I'm the coordinator for Central American Concerns for Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, which is based in New York. And uh, as you know, the Central American Concerns program began about six months ago in response to reports that we were getting from some of our Lutheran people in the field who were telling us that there were a great many Central American refugees who were coming into the southwestern part of the United States. And they wanted to know what Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, uh, how we would respond to the situation. Um, as a result of this, these reports that we were, we were receiving, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service asked me to prepare a report on the Salvadoran situation, whatever that turned out to be. And so I took myself first to the telephone in the library and did a great deal of research calling people all over the country about the Central American situation, the refugee policies of this country, the immigration history, the law, and so forth. And then I went out to the Southwest to talk with members of Lutheran social service agencies, attorneys who were trying to represent Salvadoran refugees who had come to this country and been detained by the Immigration Service. When I returned to New York, I prepared a report of about 120 pages in response to which the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service decided to establish the Central American Concerns Program. Uh, that program was established uh, around the middle of September and was then approved by the Lutheran Council uh, formally in November. And uh, the focus of this program is basically twofold. First of all, we are trying to supply funds through local advocacy projects for legal representation to Salvadorans who are being picked up by the Immigration Service. And I'll sketch in a little bit of the background later so that we can get an appreciation of what this means. And the second purpose is part of the purpose that's served by a conversation like this, which is to inform our own constituencies within the Lutheran Church, but also in the broader public of what the real situation is in terms of Salvadoran refugees in this country and in discussing that issue to come to a little more clarity on what's actually happening in Central America at this time. Um, just to give a little background of what the situation is in Central America and where these people are coming from. About 200,000 Salvadorans have been coming to the United States in the last two years. Um, they have been fleeing the violence that's been occurring in El Salvador, uh, during which at least 30,000 people have been killed also in the last two years. Now, when they come here, these Salvadoran refugees are not recognized by the United States government as bona fide refugees. Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service is basically in the business of resettling uh, government-approved bona fide refugees, many of them from uh, Southeast Asia at this point. And I'm sure many of, of uh, those who are familiar with the work of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service may have had something to do with this refugee resettlement, either as sponsors or as congregationally involved people. Um, but there are refugees in this country who have not been recognized by the government and who are being uh, treated as undocumented persons, as illegals, and returned uh, to El Salvador. And our concern in the Lutheran Church is that these people also require our help uh, and our response. And so this program, uh, the Central American Concerns Program, was put together to respond to the needs of these people. Could you tell us the, the foundation upon which the uh, Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service has come into existence and its, its work and its support system? Well, this is very interesting. The Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service began after World War II, basically to help uh, Lutherans, mostly from uh, 
the central and northern parts of Europe who had immigration problems after the Second World War. Uh, there were a great many displaced persons and persons and refugees and so forth who came to this country. And LIRS was established um, in response to those kinds of uh, situations in order to counsel and help those people with their immigration problems. Uh, then in 1975, when um, Saigon fell in Vietnam, and there was a tremendous influx of Indo-Chinese refugees, again the Lutheran Church um, responded to this influx of refugees um, by um, offering its services as what is called a voluntary agency uh, to resettle these people. The government of the United States recognized a great many people from Southeast Asia as bona fide refugees and was willing to provide a certain per capita sum of money to voluntary agencies which would then resettle uh, these refugees. And uh, LIRS has done this through a, uh, a network of regional consultants all over the country in every state uh, who um, extend themselves to congregations and try to involve congregations and individuals as potential sponsors for refugees. So there are, of course, a great many people who've had some contact with LIRS uh, through the Lutheran churches which support LIRS, the four major Lutheran denominations, the ALC, the LCA, LCMS, and the AELC, um, work together in their refugee ministries through Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. And so these same four uh, denominations of the Lutheran Church are also responding to the Central American refugee influx that's, that's now occurring, which is, of course, a very different kind of refugee ministry from the one that um, Lutheran Immigration has been known for. The Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service has been eager to resettle refugees who have come to this country uh, without, um, without any homeland. Is this uh, the direction um, which LIRS is taking now in terms of the influx of Central American and particularly Salvadorian refugees? Mm. Well, you know, this is very interesting. I think this is a concern that a lot of people in this country have, that somehow all of these people who are coming from Central America at this time um, may want to be resettled here. Um, in fact, what they want when they come here is simply a temporary safe haven, a refuge. Um, they are fleeing literally um, uh, for fear of, of their lives, and they're seeking some kind of temporary refuge. They're not seeking to be resettled here. Um, I've spoken with a great many Salvadoran refugees myself, and every single one of them would never have left and wants very much to return, uh, so long as there is a reasonable amount of stability and the possibility of living, not just living a decent life, but living at all in El Salvador. Uh, among the refugees that you have spoken with personally, uh, what are what do you see as the as the the, the causes, either human or or political or uh, situationally, that force these people to flee for their lives? Well, as you know, for the last two years at least, the level of violence in El Salvador has escalated tremendously. Um, this is a situation of people who have been living in. Um, in misery, basically, for for decades, um, the present president of the of the junta in, in El Salvador, Jose Napoleon Duarte himself, has said this is a history of people living in misery and those who have uh, everything not being willing to give up anything to those who have nothing. And of course, the disparities in, in wealth and income, uh, the ownership of land, um, access to medical care, are are tremendous. There's a very tiny group of people who have virtually all the wealth in El Salvador and the vast majority of the people who have virtually nothing. Um, out of this kind of circumstance um, and out of a fairly long, a 50-year history of military dictatorships, there's come a great deal of repression and oppression of the people. And um, I think it's interesting now that uh, we're talking a great deal about the elections that are supposed to occur in El Salvador um, at the end of March. Um, that for 50 years the people of El Salvador have been promised free and fair elections. And each time those elections have occurred, the military has set aside the results and put their own person in power. And this also occurred with Duarte in 1972 when he was elected democratically. He was arrested before he could take office, tortured and exiled to Venezuela. So that to say somehow that the elections that are going to occur in El Salvador are going to be free elections is really to fly in the face of all the evidence, all the historic evidence that, that there is. 
And I guess uh, when one pulls all of this together, the, the misery of the people, the inequities in the, in the distribution of wealth, the lack of food, in fact, three quarters of the children under five years old suffer from malnutrition in, in El Salvador. Uh, Ninety percent of the people make less than $100 a year. You put all of these circumstances together, it's not, it's not without justification, and I think it's something that one can understand, that if people would get fed up and would, um, having despaired of recourse to democratic institutions, would have said, we have to take up arms and fight to overthrow this government that's oppressing us. I think that's the kind of historic background out of which this struggle is, is coming. Doesn't that uh, sort of fly in the face of the, uh, the current um, grid or I might say um, uh, the arrangement of political uh, talk and description that is going on in terms of East and West? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the, uh, the United States government, the State Department at this point, um, has made it quite clear that they interpret this, the circumstances of the, of the struggle in El Salvador very differently from what I've just described. I think they're willing to say that conditions in El Salvador are pretty miserable, but they um, ascribe the current violence and the current struggle in El Salvador to outside communist interference, mostly on the part of Cuba um, with the help of Nicaragua and ultimately, of course, the Soviet Union. I think anyone who has studied the history of El Salvador uh, for more than a few hours uh, realizes that it has never taken and it will never take in circumstances like that outside interference to get a group of people to finally say, we've had enough. Uh, this is not the way we want to live our lives. I think we do ourselves and, and certainly the people of El Salvador a disservice to say that it took someone from the outside to come in and tell them to rebel against these kinds of circumstances. Um, I think we do ourselves a disservice because we, we remain ignorant of the real causes of these kinds of, of uprisings, these, these struggles on the part of peoples. It's interesting, you know, about 200 years ago, uh, a little more than that now, um, the people in the 13 colonies um, rose up and overthrew the government that they had. And in the Declaration of Independence, those who wrote it uh, said that people are willing basically to suffer a long time as long as evils are sufferable and people don't change institutions or ways of, of life for light and transient causes um, but when the evils become insufferable then uh, people have a duty and a right to overthrow the government that oppresses them I think uh, many of us have forgotten that this is part of our heritage as a people in a country which even then had tremendous resources and tremendous opportunities, many more, in fact, than El Salvador um, has at this time. And yet we are unwilling to grant that another people, 200 years later, might, might find themselves faced with the same kind of oppression and f might, might, in fact, have the same duty and the same right to overthrow that oppressive government. Instead, we insist on interpreting this in terms of an East-West confrontation when that's really not the appropriate way to see it. In, uh, it's my understanding that uh, Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service is uh, mainly uh, active within the, the borders of our own country. Um, certainly the, the background is, is necessary to be understood, but how is the LIRS dealing with the, with the political or with the, with the human consequence mm -hmm. of the political situation in Salvador within our own borders? Well, what's happening, I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, even 200,000 Salvadoran refugees have fled to this country uh, from the violence in El Salvador over the last two years. Unfortunately, what they expect to find here in terms of some kind of haven, uh, they're not finding because the United States Immigration and Naturalization Service, which is charged with guarding our borders against illegal entry, is picking up Salvadoran refugees and returning them to El Salvador at the rate of about 900 to 1,000 a month from all over the United States. Most of the returning is being done from Los Angeles because that's really the, numerically the center. Uh, there are perhaps 200,000 Salvadorans living in the Los Angeles area at this point, um, all of them without documents. Um, of those people who are being returned to El Salvador, uh, to the violence there, only about a quarter of them are being formally deported. In other words, they're going through deportation proceedings formally and are being judged deportable and then put on airplanes and sent back. The remainder of them are going voluntarily. 
Now one has to ask if people have been go have had to leave everything, have become refugees, and have traveled several thousand miles to get to what they believe will be a safe haven, why would they go back voluntarily? And the answer to that question is that voluntary is a relative term. For example, when a family of Salvadorans is picked up um, on this side of the uh, southern U.S. border, the Immigration Service separates family members, uh, puts men, women, and children in separate detention facilities. The ones for men look very much like, um, well, concentration camps may be a bit strong, but they are very, um, very bare, very stark uh, facilities with several uh, very tall chicken wire fences topped with very wicked looking barbed wire. Um, bunks, three-tiered bunks are crammed into uh, very small uh, cinder block rooms. Uh, the food is terrible, the medical, uh, the medical care is totally inadequate. Um, families are separated. Parents are told that they will not see their children again. Uh, children are told their parents have already been returned to El Salvador. And uh, this paper called a voluntary uh, departure form is put in front of them and they are told to sign this form because they will otherwise never see their families again anyway. Um, also bail is set on every man, woman, and child who is picked up by the Immigration Service, generally starting at $5,000 apiece. Uh, most of these people who have fled over thousands of miles and have had to pay bribes for their own safe passage through various parts of Guatemala and Mexico on their way to the United States have absolutely no resources when they arrive here. So setting a $5,000 bail on them uh, and saying if you can't pay the bail you won't get out of detention generally encourages people uh, to sign the voluntary return form because they have no prospect of getting out of detention. Beyond that, it's becoming increasingly difficult and has been for some time for those who want to supply some kind of legal representation to Salvadorans to do so, to have access to their clients. The two major um, detention facilities for men, which are located in South Texas and in Southern California, the one in South Texas is called Los Fresnos and the one in South Cal California is called El Centro. They're both, they're pretty much alike in terms of the physical layout and the treatment of the, of the detainees. Um, in both of these facilities, it has been, they're both way out in the middle of nowhere, so it takes quite a bit of time for an attorney to drive that distance. Sometimes when attorneys arrive in these places, um, they're told by the immigration service people who, uh, who man these uh, facilities that the, they can't find the detainees. Sometimes it's because the detainees have been moved. In, in, in what is either a, an intended or a thoughtless shell game. Uh, sometimes they are there, um, but the immigration service doesn't produce them, makes the lawyers wait for a long time. In terms of the detainees' access to legal counsel, which by law they are supposed to facilitate um, through providing lists of, of free legal representatives, um, through providing telephones through which uh, detainees can call them, very often, for example, the Immigration Service will confine the hours that a pay telephone can be used to after business hours so they can't reach the attorneys. Uh, very often a guard will be standing close by so a detainee cannot, cannot have a confidential conversation with an attorney anyway. And it's through these kinds of means that uh, essentially detainees are worn down to the point where they are willing to sign a voluntary departure form this, of course, saves the Immigration Service a great deal of trouble and a great deal of money mm -hmm. because they don't have to put them through the legal proceedings. Unfortunately, however, the consequences that Salvadorans face when they return to El Salvador are, are life-threatening and very often fatal. And therefore, the consequences of violating these, these rights amount uh, to, to not just the violation of due process rights, but of human rights in a very important way. Well, it seems obvious that there is some patently illegal activity being perpetrated by the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, how is how is the uh, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service countering or or um, ad uh, advising uh, the, the the stoppage of this? Well, in basically in two ways, I, I described them kind of generally before. Um, the first one is to supply. Um, funds to local advocacy projects that have arisen actually quite spontaneously in response to this, uh, to this set of circumstances I've described. Uh, people from many different denominations, including Lutherans, have joined together 
in these advocacy projects to try to supply legal representation. And so what Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service is doing through its Central American Concerns Program is to supply grants to these advocacy projects so that they can hire attorneys and paralegals who will then represent Salvadorans. Uh, the Lutheran Council in the USA has joined together with several other church bodies and legal organizations in a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to get from the Immigration Service information on the names and El Salvador addresses of people who have been returned to El Salvador by the Immigration Service. Because although we can't document what has happened to them, we know that they face extreme danger when they're returned. And the Immigration Service has up till now refused to provide that information so that we can't find out whether these people are all right when they get sent back. We suspect that they're not all right. And we further suspect that that's one of the reasons that we're not being supplied with this information. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we're trying to do is to, is to inform the public, to put pressure on, on, on uh, members of Congress to supply some kind of legal status to the Salvadorans when they're here, so that at least on a temporary basis, not on a resettlement basis, but temporarily, they can be sure that the tradition of the United States as a refuge will be, uh, will be granted to them as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in these ways, the Lutherans are really uh, taking the lead in responding to the needs of Central American refugees. There are Lutheran presences in, in South Texas, in New Orleans, in Arizona, both Tucson and Phoenix, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, and in several other parts of the country. These are really the key impact areas. Is there not risk involved in, in this kind of advocacy on the part of Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service? I think there probably is risk of political disagreement, of, uh, of differences in uh, a viewpoint of what we ought to be doing in Central America, what we ought to be doing with refugees and so forth. But it's our feeling in the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service that we have a prior commitment. And our prior commitment is to human life and human dignity. And that is not bound by or defined by a government policy. Regardless of why we're doing what we're doing in Central America, regardless of what we think ought to be done, we have a prior commitment to the human beings who are, the, who are suffering the consequences of the violence there, and we feel that we have a commitment to respond to their needs here. It seems that your, your information and the, uh, the, the outline of the circumstances require more than just the LIRS to be involved. How do you encourage and direct those, those of, the, of the church mm -hmm. to express their... their uh, uh, their concern. I, I, re I know uh, because I've met quite a number of the people in the network that has been responding to these people that there are many other church bodies who are also involved. Uh, the United States Catholic Conference is involved. Uh, the United Methodist Church is involved. Virtually every major Protestant denomination has spoken out on, um, on U.S. Uh, military aid to El Salvador. Um, for the purpose of stopping the killing, we should stop that kind of aid. But there have also been many, many denominations who have joined together on a local basis to respond to the needs of Salvadorans. In any of the impact areas, there are opportunities to become involved. As far as the areas where there are not Salvadoran refugees uh, immediately present, uh, we're encouraging people to be in touch with their Congress people because there's a great deal of opposition within the Congress, or at least thoughtfulness, regarding the treatment that we're, w that we're giving to Salvadoran refugees. Um, I think the people in Congress need to know that there is very widespread feeling in, on the part of an American people that's basically a decent people, that we, that we treat these people fairly. In, in closing, Mary, uh, we, are, we are delighted that you have, you have brought some, some light to an awful lot of confusion that is part of our own, our own environment. And we pray God's speed, and, and may your, your, uh, your voice be, be raised and be heard, and that the, the, the power of the Spirit might work through you and through the Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service to provide justice and human dignity and human freedom to those that are suffering so severely in the country of El Salvador. Thank you for your support. <laughs>